Good morning, everyone. So we're getting towards a home stretch here. Um, and thank you all for being here. And we're really excited about this panel discussion here today. Uh, it, it actually stemmed from the panel discussion we had last year, where we had EFS on the West Coast at our annual meeting. And it became such a, a, such a well-received and I think insightful panel discussion, which really provided a lot of perspective and insight on what was going on with EFS in the West Coast, um, that we decided, uh, Lori and I decided, along with the board, well, we're gonna replicate this format because um, one of the things we all know about construction is that it's, yes, there, there, there are national construction trends, there's an international building code and all of that, but a lot of construction is local. And I think Texas uh, is an interesting market to have this discussion because Texas is an economic and construction juggernaut. And think of it this way, not only is it a leader in construction spending, but as far as residential building permits, let's put it this way, in the United States for 2023, Texas by itself accounted for 15% of the country's total building permits. That is extraordinary. Okay, so, and if you look at some old data uh, for, for single family permits, I, I remember looking at it, I was like, wow, if Houston was a state and if Dallas was a state, they would be ranked number five and number six individually. So it, it's, a great, it's, it's a great session and a great panel we have discussion we're having here today. I'd also like to thank the sponsor for this group, which is Gypsum Management and Supply. And I'd like to just ask Daryl Green and Sonny Claycomb to just to stand up and just thank you for, or wave, you can just wave. And thank you for sponsoring this discussion here today. So really thrilled. So before we get started, we have a very distinguished panel of experts uh, not just in the EFS industry, but the EFS industry in Texas. So what I would like to do is ask the gentleman to introduce themselves. I'm gonna start with Kyle at the end, and then if you could just introduce who you are, who you work for, how long you've been in the industry, that would be great. So Kyle Lilly, field service manager for Stocor. I have been uh, in the industry for about 21, 22 years now. Um, been on the administration side and now the manufacturing um, great. Thank you. Kevin? Hey, good morning. Kevin Maxwell. I own Prime Wall Systems. We're an applicator. Been in the industry 22 years. Thank you. Keith? Good morning. Uh, Keith Giddens, Baker Triangle. Um, I'm president of the prefab, prefabrication division for our company. Uh, Baker's been around for, it's our 50, 50 year anniversary this year. Prefab specific, um, we celebrated our 10 year last year, so. Thank you, Andy. Morning, y'all. I'm Andy Boyd with Galindo and Boyd Wall Systems. I've uh, been with GMB for 12 years, but I've been in the industry for a little over 30. Um, mostly all of it on the uh, applicator side. Great, and Dennis. Uh, Dennis Deppner, I'm technical services manager with Masterwall. Um, been in the industry now 30 years. Um, five years prior to that, I was what came to be called a uh, building envelope consultant. Um, so uh, um, mainly on the technical specification side of the business and testing. Great, no, thank you very much, gentlemen. So I have a series of questions that I'm gonna ask all of them. And, um, and they're just gonna, the, the nice thing about this, there's no right or wrong answer and we just want their perspective. They may be consistent with each other, they may not be, and that's totally fine. And if we have some time at the end, we may have some time from questions from the floor, but I'm just gonna get right to it. And these are, I, I wouldn't call these softball questions, gentlemen, but I'll just start with you. And, and uh, so, Kyle, what do you think are the biggest headaches and competitors for EFs in Texas? North Texas, uh, specifically uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, most of the high-rise projects are, are glass, uh, so overcoming that, you know, we don't really have a, uh, a deep facade that, that matches glass, that aesthetic, so um, that's probably our biggest competitor. Uh, obviously, there's, there's you know, masonry, masonry jobs and, and the cost of areas, the brain screen systems and, and different uh, uh, 
uh, fiber cement and wood synthetics. Uh, those are always taking quite a bit of market share. Thank you. Kevin. I would think that uh, metal panels uh, is, is a big leading uh, contributor to the competition in Central Texas, where I'm from, in the Austin area. Okay, great. Keith? Uh, sure. So in, in, uh, on the prefab side, we do a little bit of everything. So it's not just eaves. Um, we do the, the metal panels and probably about to get elbow me. <laughs> but I would say uh, our, you know, our biggest competition recently is probably, like Kyle said, uh, glass. Uh, these glass uh, contractors are starting to figure out how to get uh, finishes into their systems. So they're, uh, they're starting to move in. Thank you. From my point of view, uh, there is, there is, the, we do have stuff like Nietzsche Ha, uh, like they say, the glass and all that, but there's still a stigma with a lot of the big general contractors out here that when you bring up EFs, they want to chase you out of their office pitchfork um so there's still people that have this stigma from what happened 35 years ago and to me that's the biggest challenge of trying to get it because a lot of these a lot of these projects have budget problems and EFs solves so many of those problems but yet they still don't want to hear it that, that's helpful thank you tennis um well i would say stucco is always the offset to uh eaves. um so um that, that's always something to consider, but other than that, hardy panels, Nietzsche Ha, those kind of things are, uh, are what we see. Okay. And I would like to elaborate that the, the metal panel situation is because of the fear of the eaves. It's that stigma. They're willing to pay more for the metal panels to offset having the eaves as the cladding. So what you're, what you're saying is that with the issues from 30 years ago are still affecting affecting all of you pretty pretty profoundly today. Absolutely. Okay. And the younger generation on the architectural side, they may have no clue, but they just they've heard about it. So they're not willing to go down that path. Okay. Interesting. Um, second question. What do you think can be done to increase the market penetration for East with architects and specifiers. And this time I'm going to start the other way with Dennis. Good question. I, I think where Eve shines is, is in the appearance and in the finishes and, and just everything we can do with it. Um, working with younger architects um, is going to be helpful, but you've got to get into their office and do that. Um, so it's going to be a lot of legwork, I think, is our future. For us, I really like to hammer them on sheathing technology. And I think the best thing that ever happened to East in the last 30 years is, is sheathing. And with the dense glass and the glass mat uh, face sheathing, years ago when they had those problems, they were sticking foam over the, the gyp, brown paper gyp with ribbon and dab. Uh, there was really not much of a weather barrier. Um, and that causes a lot of problems. But if you hammer them on the weather barriers that all the yeast manufacturers make, they're awesome. They're great. And so you really got to, you got to get them comfortable with what you're sticking to and what you're sticking over. And then they'll, they'll somewhat listen. And then of course, price carries a lot of weight sometimes because the East is on average, one of the more economical wall claddings you can put up. It also ages better. It's not going to rust. You're not going to have control joints leaking. You're not, you're building in 10 years, uh, you know, a stucco building in 10 years, you can, you can see its age, it's more rigid, it doesn't give, it doesn't move, especially here in the, in the heat in Texas, or the south and the west, just get hammered for eight months out of the year. But the east is going to survive that a lot better because it's, it's more pliable, it's more flexible, so it ages better. Yeah, I'd say education. Um, we we have the ability to bring architects and designers into our shop and uh, show them you know, what we do, you know, on the floor. They can go out there and walk the shop and and be hands on and see what we're doing. Um, you still get designers that you know they <clears throat> they put a a building together and have different materials and you know, finishes and whatnot and 
you can't get them to change. Um, we had a you know, deal not too long ago. We've got a project that's got a ton of hardy board on it, and um, we presented an option um, to go with Eves that looked it looked better than the hardy board did. Um, you're not penetrating the weather barriers. You know, everything's adhered. Uh, it insulates a heck of a lot better. Um, it's a simpler system and it's cheaper. Um, uh, I say cheaper, more cost effective. Um, but they still, they want a different material on the building. So, kind of the way it played out. It, it's simply time, it, you know, it, uh, no one wants to be the guinea pig or put their neck on the line, you know, so we have, we have this air where we have to let the past play out and um, have case study of how this new technology, so to speak, is uh, standing the test in time, you know, manufacturers can say how good it is, all, how great it is, but they want to see how it reacts in, in the real world over time and I think we're trending to that now where all of us have done so many EVES projects for a long time now very successfully and if we have this large bank of successful projects in different areas and different climates and conditions we can say this is truly working uh, so it's just getting over that time gap. I think it's education but there's two parts of that uh, with uh, energy codes requiring continuous insulation uh, NFPA 285, um, impact resistance, the standard things um, you know, that the designers need or require. You know, it's just educating architects and designers that, that EVES does check all the boxes. Um, and also it's educating them about the different aesthetics available. Uh, Andy mentioned Nietzscheha. Uh, you know, Nietzscheha, Longboard, they've come in, they've come in and they've taken a, you know, quite, a, quite a bit of market share. And so being able to uh, educate architects that there's a different option uh, and then you saw our long board um, where we can, we can deliver the same aesthetic and, and have less breaks in the system, uh, more continuous system, um, you know, that, that, that would be a big help. So just making sure we, we push uh, what's available out there and, and um, you know, different offerings that we have. And to Keith's point, um, you know, we try to play on their common sense. You know, you want to put up this beautiful monolithic air barrier and we all feel great that it's going to be watertight and everything's awesome but then you want me to come back and poke a hundred thousand holes in it and then we all have to guarantee it's not going to leak and only the construction industry would be that backwards so you know we we try to you, you you've taken the steps to make sure you have a very good weather barrier so why would you poke start poking holes through it Oh, that's great. I'm, I'm going to ask a follow-up because you guys brought up some great points. With architects and specifiers, and Keith, when you talked about switching a Hardy project to EVES, uh, what do you think is the biggest aha moment for, let's say you're talking to architects and specifiers who don't, who, who are uninformed about EVES, what, what, do you, what do you think is the most surprising thing that, that clicks in their mind when they learn about it and they're thinking, wow, that's really cool. I had no idea. Or what are the, if it's two or three things, what do you think they are? And I'll start, um, Keith, I'll, I'll start with you and then we'll go back and forth from there. Sure, I think um, it's probably like, uh, like he said, poking all the holes through the weather barrier. You know, when you, actually put that in front of them and show them what you're doing to the to the system and the integrity of it kind of like it the light bulb goes off and they move forward some of them do some of them don't okay you know it's interesting from a sales perspective if we go in and we're promoting this one source manufacturer one source installer for this you know mixed cladding so to speak and with all the different finishes and whether it be thin brick on top or whatever, they may think it, it's a, a sales pitch, you know, and we're trying to get more of the market share when really it boils down to we, this group of, of guys up here, I mean, we, we love what we do. We're truly passionate. If we, we sincerely believe that, that that is the best way because we see what works, what doesn't work. And again, when it's a one continuous assembly, it, it's a no-brainer. And when you break it down black and white, again, that's an aha moment. 
probably the biggest aha is, is um, I think they're very surprised a lot of times by the impact resistance that can be achieved uh, with those reinforced sessions. One of my favorite things to do is to get somebody a hammer and let them go out of the board and see if they can break it. And you know, it, does, it doesn't break. So that's, that's really a, a surprising thing for most architects. And also, like I said, just, just the ability to deliver any aesthetic uh, with, with the engineered system, less transitions, less breaks. Uh, that, that should be. We like to talk to them about the, the single source supplier. Um, I have no problem waiving any, any EAPS manufacturer's warranty in front of these people where they can see these 10, 12, sometimes 15 year warranties. Uh, that puts people at ease. But I also like to explain, especially to the GC or the architect, you know, plaster over, over rigid insulation is great. However, in that wall system, you have about seven different manufacturers. And if something goes wrong, each one of them can come out there and tell you, well, my, my, my insulation is insulating the building. My lab is holding up the scratch and brown, but it's not structural to handle the, the back and forth. You've got a scratch and brown manufacturer, you've got a, a weather barrier manufacturer, and you've got a finish manufacturer. And you've got seven or eight people in one wall system, and none of them are wrong if something goes wrong. So it's me, the GC, and the owner sitting here with a large bag of you know what, and we have to deal with it. When you're dealing with an EFIS wall, you got one manufacturer, and I love to tell people it's either it's one back to pat on or one butt to chew. That's it, <laughs> from the sheathing out. So we're all in the same boat together. We all live and die together. So it, you know it's a more cohesive, uh, it's a more it's a it's a more group think type deal. It's a team team. Team building thing. Great. No, that's, that, that helps. Yeah, and um, I guess I always use the numbers 100 and 0. Um, so when you're putting the air and water barrier on the building, you've got 100% coverage. When you're adhering the foam, you have zero holes. And that seems to mean a lot. Um, back in the old days, uh, we used to talk about the monolithic exterior. Um, and that's still there. It's, it's a great thing. I, I love how we can do that. Um, to Andy's point, one trade's out there, we can make it look like brick, stone, wood. You know, these days you can do anything with it, but it's all monolithic. So even on the outer surface, there's no holes to get into this, for water to get in. Um, architects still don't get that, but um, <laughs> they don't understand monolithics, it seems to be. No, I mean, it, 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 so there, you, you all brought up some, some different points, which is really good. And, and you know, you brought up the performance, you brought up the single source solution, you brought up the aesthetics. Um, and, and it's just interesting that, that EFs, EFs can do it all. I, I think one of the things that we, we find at the, at the association level, it, it's, you know, coming up with a sound bite that covers all of that is, is not necessarily easy, but maybe that's something that we, we, we as an association and in this industry uh, shouldn't have to shouldn't have to do too, so, um, or, or can't do, and that, that's fine. But um, switching gears here for a second, um, <clears throat> insurance. So it, it's been a long-standing topic. Uh, we, we, we heard about it in some of our working group meetings that we had yesterday, is that, that insurance is a real challenge. Uh, just so everybody knows, at EMA's level, we have engaged and still engage Buck Buchanan, who is a three-time president of EMA himself. He does help us with the insurance, uh, the insurance matter. We have a, a, a section on our new website about it. But how how much of an of an issue is insurance to all of you getting insurance for EFs uh, getting for you right now? And I'll start, Dennis, since you just start. I'm going to start with you and then go that way, please. I'm going to be quick. Um, I'll take a pass. Fair enough. Not that familiar. There's still not a lot of people out there that want to want to cover EFs. Um, we we renew every year in January, February, and you know we have one or two carriers to uh, to pick from. It's not cheap, um, but um, you know we 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 keep thinking as long as we keep putting up good work uh, and our billings are sound and we're not getting sued or not having problems that at some point that to me that's the only way out of that is all of the applicators in Texas 
uh, is if we do a good job and we represent the industry correctly, and we're and we're putting it on correctly, and we're and and the manu and the suppliers, I know they have to make a living too. They got to eat. They got they got mortgages. They got to be careful who they're selling to, and that's what got everybody in trouble 30 years ago. They were just selling to anybody and everybody, and nobody was paying attention. So. As an, as an applicator in Texas, I owe everybody in this room, everybody in this state to do the best job I can to represent what EAST can do. Great. Amen. Um, yeah, we've, we've worked with the same carriers for a year, so that's not, that's not much of an issue for, for us. Okay. Uh, yeah, same same answer. Uh, ultimately, there's a very few select carriers that that would entertain uh, that scope, but uh, the ones that do, uh, it's been a great relationship. It hadn't been anything that's uh, been devastating, or you know, anything to make us think we want to not install Eve. So it's the opportunity is there. Just from a you know building owner's pers perspective, um, you know, there's obviously insurance options out there. I mean, we're selling millions of square feet of EVs every year and buildings are getting insured. Um, the challenge I'm facing is, is with somebody like FM Global who would rather uh, approve an a, a untested or, or a, a system using different components and different manufacturers rather than uh, approving or insuring a, a completely engineered EVs system. And it's because they require um, certain levels of testing done in their, their lab and their facilities. Um, and, and they, they uh, are the insurance provider for, for several universities and hospitals here in Texas. And so you know, that's all those projects we're missing out on and don't have a shot at. Great. So um, as, as you can tell, the, <clears throat> the theme of these questions that I've been asking all talked about in external factors relating to the East industry, whether it's architects and specifiers, competition, insurance. Um, we're, before we move over to more internal factors affecting the EVES industry in Texas, just wondering if there are any questions from the floor that you'd like to ask. Uh, we, can, we can ask a couple. Uh, if, if, you, if you all would like to ask any of these gentlemen any questions about some of the external factors, competition, et cetera, uh, before moving on. There are quite a few, um, personally, and I'm probably, this is probably not going to be a very popular statement, but I can't stand mechanically fastened EVs. I don't think it should be a thing. That's just my opinion. But I see a lot of it going up on small buildings uh, and little, uh, you know, shopping centers here or there. Uh, and then you drive by it, you know, six months, eight months later after they've done it. Um, and it looks like what we, we laugh at the office, we call it running bond EFs. And I've got a picture on my phone that you won't believe. It's so bad, you could almost say it was done on purpose. And those are the kind of jobs, I've seen some really bad you know, foam trim jobs, you know, and I just cringe when I see this stuff because it reflects on all of us. And you know, I think that's where as an industry, we've gotta be careful about who we're selling to and who, who we're letting putting this on. I don't want to make it an exclusive club. I'm not trying to go that way. But, you know, people need to understand what they're putting on. They're just out there, you know, uh, mechanically fastened foam boards and they're not rasping. They're not doing a lot of, the, they're not back wrapping. Uh, and, you know, it's just in six or seven years when some, you know, lawyer drives by that building and sees it looks pretty rough. He can go to the building owner, hey, let's sue this guy for this and we'll get you some money because you got a bad EAST job. It may be performing okay, but it, there's still problems within it. It's not done to manufacturer specifications, which opens you up to lawsuits. And here's another EAST lawsuit, and there's another one, another one, and another one. And that's, that's what keeps, keeps this cycle going. I don't think it's any different than any other industry, to be honest with you. Um, you know, we're, we're not the EVES police. We can't monitor every job and be on every job. 
Uh, what we can do is we can educate general contractors, um, point out the fact that it's, it's not about the lowest bid or the lowest number, um, educate them on the systems themselves, how they're installed, how they're supposed to be installed, um, and then go from there. Um, you know, it's, it's ultimately their responsibility to make sure things are installed correctly, and it's just educating them to know what to look for. What we see in, in the Austin area is a, a really big delta in between. You've got the, the fast food restaurants, you've got the really small stuff that has some very poor quality installations. And then from there up, you know, your, your office buildings, your, your bigger commercial jobs, some, I would say, some pretty premier work. So um, it's an interesting dynamic between the two, and uh, most of it is a derivative of, of money, you know? Great. Thanks for the question. Any others? Okay. So now I'm going to talk a, a little bit, or we're going to ask the panelists um, some other questions about internal factors. But before I do that, and I forgot to mention this at the outset, there are two EMA members that helped put this, this session together. Um, and without their heavy involvement and participation, um, this session would be happening today. I'm going to ask them to stand. One of them is Flavio Ronzani and George Adams. Okay. Um, <clears throat> these, these gentlemen really took it upon themselves to, to, um, to, to assemble the panel that we have here today, and, and it, it's very much appreciated. So thank you, gentlemen, for doing that. Um, so now, now talking to, about some in, internal uh, more, I would say, e EAPS internal questions. Um, and and um, it, we're going to talk quickly about um, workforce development and education. So we have a working group on education and workforce development. We met yesterday. We had a spirited uh, conversation about it. Actually, just so you all know, we have, a, 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 through AWCI, launched their EAPS Doing It Right second edition. It is now live. Um, it's something, just so you all know it, how, how EMA feels about it, um, we not only support it conceptually, but we supported it financially. We, we contributed $25,000 to that effort in, in cash and, and advertising placements as well. So we're behind it. Um, but of course, that's only part of the picture, uh, you know, because an online course can, can help establish a baseline, but we know that it can't, it, it doesn't translate into effective uh, workmanship in the field. But one of the, one of the questions we have for, for all of you, and I'll start with, um, start with Dennis, and it, it's just, what, what do you all think? You know, how is the, the workforce situation here in Texas, and what can be done to increase workforce development and education with, it, with EVES? Oh, boy. Uh, that's a broad question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I guess the, the main thing is going to be with us awareness. Uh, it's going to be training on some of the specific products um, because uh, a lot of the new products that are out there are, are not on a data sheet. Uh, you can't pick up on how to do it. Um, so uh, we're back to hands-on okay. uh, is, is a lot of our training on those things. Yeah, same thing for us. You know, there's, we do a ton of masonry work as well and we're part of the Masonry Council Association, and those guys do a master class in, in, in attracting young men who don't want to go to college but want to learn a trade. Uh, they, do a, they do an outstanding job of getting to those guys and teaching them masonry and showing them the benefits of masonry. Um, not everybody wants to grow up and be a plasterer. That's just a sad part of it. Um, so the guys that that we have, we, we find a couple that are pretty bright. We stick them next to or right between two or three of our, our better plasterers and tell them, you know, close your mouth, open your eyes and ears and do what they do and listen and, and you know, you'll have a future here. But, uh, you know, we, we still do Saturdays. You know, we got some new guys. Hey, this is how you float. This is how you trial. This is how you did back wrap. This is how you stick the foam, um, you know. Jerry Jones doesn't call the NFL to show up and have somebody teach his wide receivers how to run routes. He has people to do that for him. And so we kind of feel like it's on us. If we want a good workforce, we're going to have to train them ourselves. 
Yeah, so on the, the prefab panel side, it's, it's similar to what Andy was saying. Um, since we kind of run in a, a manufacturing process, we have the ability to you know, plug different guys and gals in the line um, for different pieces of the, the process. And they can stay there, you know, say we put them stick in foam, they can stay there the entire job or um, you know, we can we have the ability to move them around and cross train them within the shop. So uh, it's pretty nice being able to, to train. Uh, it's, I mean, it's on the job training and um, being under you know, one roof, we kind of have a lot of eyes on everything that goes on. So I, I think initially it's getting over the stigma that the plastering trade is a lower tier trade, you know, especially from a financial standpoint. You know, it's amazing what my payroll is every single week. There are guys making a very healthy living. So the younger generation, if, if you know, helping them understand that this is a, a viable, long-time career, that they can support a family and have, have a great living. Um, so that is the training aspect will be forever. And that is something we're all desperately working on uh, constantly. Um, and you can tell right away if, if someone's interested or going to work or not. And we have to sift through a lot of those, unfortunately. But I guess for us, it's just getting people in the door initially to say, hey, this is something you can support your, your family on. I think for manufacturers, it's, um, we come at it several different ways. I think the first thing we do is we try to make it as simple as possible for the process. We look at um, waterproofing a wall with uh, a fluid applied uh, versus a paper wrap. And the fluid applied is, is much easier to do. Um, it doesn't take that high of a skill level to be able to do that. So we need to continue to make products that are easy to install. Um, we also, you know, instructional videos online. Um, uh, and then the third part of that is, is out in the field, make sure that we're available with uh, our, our technical field support, uh, doing demonstrations and, and that kind of thing. So. Great, great. Um, uh, no, that, that's, um, that's helpful. And I, I think to, to piggyback on that, um, I'm bouncing around here a little bit because those are really insightful responses. Just not just with training and education, but that could be part of this answer. Um, but what do you all think that the associations, and I'm talking about TLPCA and EMA, could do to help, if anything, enhance um, workforce development and education here in Texas? And I'll start with Dennis. Well, um both great groups, they're, they're really promoting the industry. Um, I guess the one thing that came out here is uh, we're all getting older. Um, everyone here is pretty old. You all look pretty old. Um, <laughs> so uh, how, how are we bringing in the, the, the youth? And um, where's Sarah? Uh, Sarah, um, just listening to Sarah's plan on, on bringing in new workers um, is great. Um, I don't know how we get them younger, but uh, I think we need to do that because this industry is aging out. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a very tough question because uh, it's it's a massive, massive answer uh, or a massive undertaking to do that. You know, I'll go back to the Masonry Council where they've been able to penetrate the school systems and the local junior colleges with brick laying classes and masonry classes. Uh, and so that glamorizes that a little bit. Oh, I can go to college and learn how to learn how to lay brick, but if you want to learn how to plaster, you got to come to my shop on Saturday. I mean, which which one carries more weight? Which one looks like it offers you more? Um, so you know, I, my son just graduated from A and M. We would go to the. I went to a couple of career fairs with him. You know, I saw a masonry. I saw Acme there, I saw some of the Masonry Council people there. I've never seen an EMA guy there. I've never seen a TOPCA. Not saying that hasn't happened before. I've just never seen it. So either some of these school, bigger school districts that have career day, fair day, getting a representative there. And I think it's important too to get a younger guy or a man that looks like what they look like. And 
let's be honest, I don't have a lot of white and black men coming through my front door looking for jobs. They're all, they're all Mexican from South American. They speak Spanish. Um, and so it's better to have someone that looks like them speaking to them about their own, their own preferences. And if, if there's one thing I think the TLPCA and EMA could do better is get more bilingual. You know, I don't speak Spanish. I wish I did. My dad tried to get me to do it all my life, and I refused, and, I, and now I regret it. But that's what we need. We need people that look like them and talk like them to be able to relate to them. They're not going to relate to me. They're not going to relate to Keith. It's just how it goes. I, I can't, it's hard for me to relate to a 21-year-old kid from Mexico, but that's where we're at. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, you know, as far as getting some of the younger generation in, maybe hit up the high school career de career fairs. Uh, some of these kids that, you know, may not want to go off to college. Uh, we used to do it uh, a long time ago, and it worked well for, for uh, we got several good ones out of it, but yeah, just uh, maybe some of these kids don't want to go off to college and this will be their career. Not to be repetitive, but it, it, I think it does start with the schools. Uh, interesting story, about 12 years ago when there was really starting to be a, a shortage of, of the younger guys coming to the trade. I mean, you know, the days of having the 16 and 17 year old son come to work with their dads in the summer, we just don't see that anymore. I mean, my youngest guy right now is 23 years old. That's mind boggling. And so, the school in Georgetown where I graduated, they had something called co-op. My senior year, I went to school one day a week and then I went to work. Um, I went back to that same co-op program and wanted to speak about my business and the opportunities in the plastering world. And they said, uh, we can't have you here because you're not promoting, we have to promote, the kids need to go directly to college. That was there, you know, for whatever funding purposes, whatever. They literally said I couldn't go to my alma mater to, to speak if I was going to promote coming to a trade instead of going to college. So really interesting. It, that was a really deflating. Same answer. It, it starts with the schools, uh, both high school, uh, junior college, and, and uh, trade schools. Um, other than that, it's just, um, you know, EMA working with its members, these guys that are big players in their markets to, to develop some sort of workshop or, or plan of attack and, and manufacturers being supportive of that however we can. Great, those are, those are uh, great answers, um, all of them. And um, I'm gonna ask another softball, um, since I know that that was kind of a big, a big question, but you, gentlemen, you have to pretend that there are no manufacturers, distributors, or other contractors in the room when I ask you this question, but what can, manuf what, what can people in the industry do, manufacturers, distributors, and contractors, do more that they're not doing now? But let me preface it by saying, and I'll talk about this in the executive director's report later, we had a good year last year. The East industry had a very good year last year when it comes to net sales. Um, so I don't want to take that, take, take the, got to preface it with that. It was a very good year. But obviously, we want to do more. And with that said, where, from, where, from where your positions are, what you do in the market that you're in, um, if, if you had a blank sheet of paper, what do you think that the manufacturers, distributors, and or contractors answer it any way you want? do that, that that's not being done now that you think they could help the industry, I would say, achieve new heights that they're not achieving right now. So, and I will start with Kevin. Well, I'm the type of guy that's not gonna wait on anyone else. I mean, this is how I feed my children. So I'm gonna go <laughs> beat down doors. I speak to architects and, and, and developers and clients. Uh, you know, I do everything I can in, in my own little world as best I can. And I know these gentlemen are doing the same. So hopefully, you know, that will segue into this ball rolling in, in, in a bigger direction. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my perspective on it. Great. 
Uh, again, I go back to educating um, architects and designers uh, just about the, uh, the performance that we can achieve, um, checking all the boxes, uh, the aesthetics that are available. Um, and also, it would, you know, in my opinion, it would be nice to have a little bit higher level support. And you know, we still have municipalities that, that restrict EFs, um, regardless of uh, House Bill 2439. Um, you know, it's still a challenge in some, some areas. And so some kind of support from, from EMA, uh, whenever we run into that, would be very helpful. Great. 100%. Great. Um, g and B's only been in business. We've only been around for 12 years, but I've already started keeping note of each jobs we did in 2013, 2014. So what I'm trying to do is build a database to show these architects and some of these general contractors, look, at some point this building's 20 years old. It's EFs, and it's ne we've never gone back to touch it. Yes, they've had to go back and recalk it, as you should, but as far as the EFs, it has, has held up and it's performing as intended. Stowe's been putting up EFs for 50 years. Drive it, all of them. If, if you could ask me one thing, I think you should put together a history of some of your oldest jobs, best performing jobs, so when I'm sitting there and I can say, well, here's a Parx job, here's a Stowe job, here's a, here's a Drive It job that's been standing for 40 years and they haven't had one single problem with it. Show them the history of this, uh, of this, this industry. And show them that it, it does stand up to the test of time and when it is applied correctly, it, it, it will last for its full life cycle. No, that's great. Yeah, you mentioned 23 was a, a good year, and uh, I think we've got some momentum behind us. Um, and it's been a buildup over the, you know, the last several years, um, you know, with help from, you know, manufacturers and distributors and everybody involved. Um, it's, uh, I mean, we have great relationships with, you know, Kyle and you know, George, and there's hundreds of them that, you know, help us any way that they can. Uh, we help them any way that we can, and it's a, it's a team effort. So I think uh, everybody keep up the good work. I, I think ultimately it's also getting out in front. By the time we're handed a, a job or, or see it, it's gone through so much legwork to get to that point. By the time we have a chance to talk, they love the idea about it, but they don't want to go backwards at that point. It's just too much work. So being way out on the front end is huge. Great. And I, I guess I'd say the longer I'm in this industry, the smaller it feels. Um, so that's uh, a little depressing, <laughs> maybe. Um, but uh, anyone watch the uh, SpaceX launch this morning? Um, you know, when you see that, that's what I think about EVES. It is, it's a high performance composite. Um, Peter in our tech meeting was, was talking about the addition of strength that's not supposed to be there, but it is. And, and we've got this really space age, high performance composite that we're selling. And it's, that's unique in our industry. Great. Excellent, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we have some time for some questions from the floor. If anybody would like to ask away, I, I, we don't have a mic around, but I think they're, they're, they're if, you, if you just uh, raise your hand and stand up. Yes, Dave. So um, just Kyle and Stowe um, in the shop when we, if there's a new product that comes out or, you know, something that they're toying with that they may, you know, may think about introducing, they'll send guys in from wherever, um, do a hands-on training uh, on the materials. So that, that does help a lot. Yes. I think vi visit the high schools, you know. Very few and far between is a random student going to step 
up to a, a plaster shop. It's just not going to have the farthest thing from their mind unless their dad said, you're coming to work with me today. So go to the public schools, in my opinion. Yeah, just we got to show them the longevity, you know, make them understand you can go anywhere. In the, once you learn this trade, you can go anywhere in the U.S. or anywhere in the world and make a living for your family. And, you know, a college degree is nice, uh, but they're not for everybody. And, you know, some degrees you get sold a, a, a bag of goods. And then when these kids graduate, the best they can, they've spent three hundred and fifty, four hundred thousand dollars on a on an education. Then they get out of school and they're making 50 grand and they're stuck. Well, you know, you can skip all that and you can come right to work for me. And in 60 days, you'll have insurance. You'll be making 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars starting out. And I've got plasters now that are, you know, making 80, 90 thousand dollars a year. And that's that's pretty good work with no debt. And it's it's a skill that in a trade that you've been taught. That's what they need to understand is. My, my nephew, he's, he didn't go to college, and I would love to have a hundred of him because he is a high-performance young man. But he said, screw college. I'm going to electrical trade school. He skipped all of that, and that, that kid is setting the world on fire. He's out of debt. He's got his own home. He's 25 years old, and he is loving life because he didn't, he didn't take the bait that they're pushing at these schools. It's, it's almost like you're a second-class citizen now, in their eyes, if you don't have a college degree. And I've got 800 employees, and maybe 40 of us have college degrees, and that really doesn't mean a damn thing at the end of the day. If you're making the money you want, and you're having a, a good life, and you can support your family, who needs that piece of paper on the wall? That's what we have to get through to them. Great. That's a great answer. Thank you. Any? Mm -hmm. Because you talk about educating at the trade school, but we also have the art community, young architects coming mm -hmm. up that want to run. Mm -hmm. So as EMA members and manufacturers, we should be working together, dividing and conquering. You're going to focus on this, you're going to focus on this. And working together to try and grow both the architectural side and that knowledge and the applicant side. Yep. Yeah, and, and actually, our, our, Mark, you're exactly right. And, and, and actually, we have courses that actually address both groups right now. And you're, you know, I think anything that we're trying to do collectively, it, it, there's no silver bullet. Um, if there is a silver bullet in anything that we do, it lasts about five minutes, right? It, it's going to be a, a, a kind of a slow, steady drumbeat, multi-pronged, integrated approach uh, going after several different targets at the same time, absolutely. Sir, you had a question?
Thank you. Oh, that's great. Great comment. Great comment. Thank you. We have time for one more. I'm going to say, well, two more. Oh, wait, three more. Yes, sir, Daryl. For me, it, it's it's hard to uh, it's hard to argue with, with real data, so you know, or ICC code reports, um, NFPA 285 testing. Uh, it's just making them aware of those things. Um, I've recently had on that, actually one of Andy's jobs, um, a long discussion with the city of Dallas how they they wouldn't allow uh, east on a high rise down there in Dallas, and uh, it took several months of going in there and, and sitting with all of their code officials and building inspectors and educating them on the current EVE systems, uh, the code reports, the testing that they have. Um, and, and finally, it's, you know, they, they approved it and we moved forward with the project. So, um, you know, TLPCA, Eddie does a good job. A few times a year, he'll get some, some local code officials in for a launch and learn. Um, to, to be one of the manufacturers come in and, and educate them there. So. Um, it's continuing to work those avenues and just making sure that they're aware uh, of what the use is today. You know, like Kyle was saying, you know, we've also had IPC checkers here in the Internet checkers. I'm sure I'm going to say this over. Uh, you know, $100, you know, $100 for your hair is going to be worth that. And you can, in your hair, you can give us a little bit of this kind of plastic that you can use. And you're going to be trying to find some place to learn from Kyle. Yeah, and I would, I guess, add to that. I mean, you've got your code report, which covers the, the basics of the ICC, and then, then unique to Texas is the uh, Texas windstorm engineer, who's a, a beloved uh, person. Um, but uh, you do have separate code reports for the, the coastal Texas uh, that you have to follow as well. So you do have to guide them through now and then. Great. A any other panelists want to address that one? or In the Austin area, it's pretty challenging. Um, the code officials there are, are understaffed, overworked, and we get very limited access. And um, so it, it's a challenge. You get just a few minutes with them, and most of the time they just don't want to deal with it, unfortunately. So if there was a formal opportunity, you know, once a quarter, once a year, something would, would be good, but we just rarely get that opportunity. We did have two more. I'm going to be uh, quick. So, George, did you have a question? Okay. Good question. It's good. I think that's excellent. I would say food for thought, because um, I think that you know one of the things that we're hearing. And I was just thinking in my mind, George and, and Eddie, nice to, thanks for coming. And I think that, um, you know, I see a logical breakout between what EMA, AWCI can do and TLPCA can do because TLPCA is a local group, right? And, and, and you have the relationships and frankly, the credibility um, that, that we don't have to probably go in locally to local programs and all that kind of thing, along with manufacturers. Of course, I've never talked to Eddie about that. You may say this is impossible, but that, that kind of thing. With EMA and AWCI content, okay, as a support for that. Because, um, you know, what you're talking about is 
I think one of the things that EMA has to do, we have to, we have to maximize our strengths. So we're small, uh, but, but we've got some very, very substantial members who've got a very, very wide footprint, and we have to take advantage of that. Um, and, 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 and I think some of the other groups, like the local groups, they may not be as big, but they're here, um, or they're in Minnesota, or they're in California, or something like that. So, but I think, I think that's a, a, I don't have a snap answer to that, but that's a great question to consider going forward. That's a, that's a great question. Um, stay tuned, I guess, is the best answer I can give right now. But that's a great question and a great point. Thank you for that. Corey, did you have a question? Oh, that's great. That's a great comment. Um, well, gentlemen, we could go on all day, it looks like, but I think it's, it's time. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Kyle, Kevin, Keith, Andy, and Depnis, Dennis for participating in today's panel. So, gentlemen, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much for that. I'd also, again, like to thank Flavio and George Adams, I would say, for quarterbacking this effort. So, gentlemen. And I'd like to thank GMS for sponsoring this session. Um, thank you all for being here. And now I'm going to turn it over. Five, we'll take a five minute break. So we'll reconvene at around quarter of, yeah? Quarter of 11. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>